Again, as you well know, and for those who don't, this is not our normal type of service. But uh, one of the reasons that it's not normal is simply because I'm trying to uh, make a case, an appeal, as it were, for uh, changing uh, some things. And uh, the reason that I do that first by uh, bring it, uh, bringing it to the congregation is because people don't like change. People like <laughs> to stay where they are, sit where they are, not be moved, not be bothered. And uh, some uh, change is threatening uh, to folks. And uh, of course, we don't want to do that. We want to prepare everybody for what's coming and for what uh, uh, is possible uh, if we all pull together and head uh, a certain direction. Now, uh, I was uh, telling you uh, uh, several things here uh, as we left the first hour. And uh, that is about grace churches, say in Michigan. Um, some of the, and I use the phrase old timers, uh, simply because there are people that were there literally from the start and saw the grace movement in its heyday and founded some of these great bigger churches uh, in through Michigan and other areas. And some of these younger pastors came in there and they started uh, putting on these programs. I told you about the one Pastor Moki uh, uh, told uh, us about, and that was that two mimes came in. Now right there, we would have had a good old fashioned altar sacrifice, slitting of throats <laughs> uh, with these mimes because, uh, you know, I don't, but the mimes came in. And of course, you know, I'm speaking facetiously, I'm just teasing. But the mimes came in, and one was God the Father, and one was God the Son, and they were dressed in all their, their makeup and, and, and so forth, and they had this interpreter. And the whole thing was, instead of teaching the Word of God, the one mime was supposed to be God the Father, who had a heart, and he handed, a, handed it to God the Son, and he, he uh, told God the Son, go to the world and show them my heart. And, um, and to that we would say, whoopee-ding, you know, uh, great, wonderful. And, but to to literally uh, stepping on the work of all these people up to this point, and the old timers began complaining. We'd like to hear the Bible taught. We don't want all this ritual, and that's where Christendom is going back uh, toward uh, ritual, covenant theology, uh, uh, Catholicism type thinking, and so forth, because now we're becoming ecumenical, we're all one, doctrine doesn't matter, and so forth. And, um, and some of the old timers were complaining. And some of these, these new pastors said, so what? Now, they're the ones that gave the money to buy the building, <laughs> to, to build it, the property, and so forth. And they come in here with these newfangled ideas that are contrary to the Word of God. And the people complained and said, wait one second. We just want, we just want to sing and study the Bible. Forget the rest of this nonsense. Now, one guy split one of the big churches up there and now has Celebration Church. And by the way, um, it wasn't a year and a half later that the Celebration Congregation pitched him out. And the <laughs> what a mess. Uh, same thing up in the church in Michigan, one of the, one of the uh, great Baltimore's uh, churches there. Harry uh, uh, Baltima Sr. started that church. One time, you know, with hundreds of grace believers there. You know what the pastor does now? He teaches his people choreography so that they move the right way at a certain time and this way at a certain time and, and have their cues because that's the big thing, teaching them choreography. Now, you know, uh, that certainly wouldn't go here. Uh, I do a little, I do a good soft shoe sometimes before the service, but other than that, that, that is their emphasis. Uh, and, and so I saw the grace movement going this particular uh, direction. And it's a direction that I don't want to go. It, it doesn't matter. I don't want to go that direction. I believe in their basic theology. I do not believe in their philosophy of ministry. Because they only take Christianity to a certain point. There's much more uh, to be understood and to stand for than just simply the dispensational um, uh, uh, view of history and teaching. Now, that's, that's important. But you have to understand, Paul said, I've given to you the whole counsel of God, which means we have to teach the whole realm of doctrine through a Pauline perspective. And, and that's something they don't want to do. Not only do they not want to, to, to stand for the mystery, by the way, there are professors in the school that are saying to people, Pete Allen had some problems with uh, some students from GBC who came to his church and said, oh, don't teach the mystery in your morning service. 
When Pete says, well, well, duh, uh, why not? That's what I stand for. We're a grace church. Oh, no, no. You, you got to kind of sneak up on people. Let them come and you just preach a generic gospel message. And then later on, you let them know what, what you stand for. And of course, uh, he didn't stand for that. And those people left and went right down to a church called Applegate, where they have two or 3,000 people. They're Pentecostal, charismatic tongue speakers, standing up, you know, frothing at the mouth, jumping around and so forth. But they're grace believers in those churches because a grace pastor stood for the message and taught it to his people, and they said, we don't want to talk. And Pete said, and I've heard this from several other sources, well, who told you not to stand for these things in church? Professor so-and-so at GBC, or this teacher at GBC. And of course, uh, so we, we saw this happening. Then, again, the conveyor belt. We've come into contact with a group of people who, who hold basically to, to our theology. There's a little confusion here between Acts 2 and Acts 9, but um, aside from that, they teach what we do, but they do it differently. They use modern methods of, of communication. Now, uh, they illustrate the Word of God. And that's, uh, that's one of the very first places, some years back, with one of the founders of this doctor movement, that, that there is nothing wrong with, with technology per se, nothing wrong with using a PA system or, or, or singing and that, that sort of thing, fine. But it has to be done in a certain way, and, um, and it's, it doesn't have religious attachments. What it does is to illustrate. Now, uh, we'll turn on my... Uh, stick figure draw, drawings here in just a little bit. But what, what I want to do is to try to get away from that. Now, um, I didn't hear any amens. I'm sure there are a lot of praise God's hallelujahs out there. But uh, it brought us this far. But now is the time, if we can, to move ahead. Now, just let me say this. Um, uh, this, uh, this projector right here, whether we go the other route or not, is going to have to eventually be replaced. <laughs> it is a Model T. We've got to, to uh, uh, crank it up uh, from time to time uh, and, uh, and change the oil in it and plugs and, and the like. It's got about 200,000 miles on it. But it's getting just a little bit um, uh, old and worn out. But now here's the thing. With regard, with regard to this, I would like to at least keep this one and down the road, uh, hopefully replace it and still keep the overhead projector that we have. And the reason being is that sometimes we will simply use the transparencies that, that, uh, for this particular type of uh, uh, illustration, use on the overhead, but I will do them professionally on the computer. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, uh, CN, uh, if you would come over here, for those that didn't get the Wednesday night uh, uh, drawings, uh, as it were, I don't mean drawing, and you would like to have one of these, please just raise your hand. Just raise your hand if you have not gotten one and are interested in, in getting it. But that's what this type of deal is what we are capable um, of doing on the overhead and, and giving to you in a, in a professional illustration. And I would like to, uh, I would like, we, we are going over through the Feast of the Lord on Wednesday nights and on, on some Sundays. And so we're illustrating uh, these various things. Now, one thing about that, that, that to get to that point took lots of man hours, training, lots of money to buy the computers and to learn how to do it and to put in the time to do it. And so what I'm saying is that's gonna be one of the things that we're gonna have to, to decide. Uh, with regard to services and and this type of deal, because I will not be able to be excuse the, the the expression I will not be able to be the normal pastor, um, and I've we've we've changed that a long time ago. But I just just want to say 
I'm going to have to spend time in number one doing this to illustrate it and number two doing the research uh, in order to to have handouts for you and that that is the the uh, the big thing to have it written and illustrated so uh, we're just just going to have to decide which way to go because uh, you know most pastors think that their job is is hand holding and running around here and doing this that and the other and getting uh, getting a can of peas for the for the soup kitchen and and that that type deal and that's not a pastor teacher's job that's what liberal religion thinks but the bible says that a pastor's job is to is to assimilate the dynamics of the word of god get it to his people so that they grow and can use it in their lives on the job at home wherever so um, just understand that that uh, that's that's one thing but now when i came into um to um ron's church and i've showed you the the video here but it's 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 definitely different and by the way just as a, a um to calm everybody i am not advocating again just to just to soothe your nerves well boy the pastor is going to become you know fanatic and extremist we're going to do away with it not at all i am not advocating we do away with music i'm just uh, saying we're going to have to decide how it fits in our program so that it doesn't compete with with this um, I love music myself and want to con continue to perform and the, and the like. Um, uh, secondly, I'm not advocating that we change uh, children's church and, and uh, Sunday school, but we're not going to uh, call it that. And for the little ones, um, uh, we, we won't do that. But as, as soon as we possibly can to assimilate them into the congregation as they are ready uh, and the like, that, that we do that. Uh, but, but as I said, when I, when I came in here, every, every Pete, there was a there was a buzz and there was a hubbub and, and talking. But everybody found their seat, uh, had, was ready, and believe you me, before he stood up, everybody was seated about five minutes till. Nobody came in late. Nobody. I, I mean that that's odd, <laughs> yeah, given the fact that I've been in the ministry thirty some years, and and that's that's always been that's always been a factor. Everybody and five minutes, everybody was in their seat. And I was standing up here talking with others. All of a sudden, they all disappeared. I was the only one left standing. It was five minutes till the hour. I thought, oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Uh, what am I doing here? I immediately sat down, right on time. He stood up. Whole congregation stood up, including little ones, all the way up. They turned to the American flag and, and, and gave the Pledge of Allegiance and so forth. They sat back down, grabbed their pens, and off they went to the study of the scriptures. Now, beforehand, he has, he has this, and he also has um, a projector that can give animation. And uh, there, there is this type screen, and there's also another type screen in his auditorium. And as you come in here, things begin popping on the screen. The first thing is, like we have in the bulletin today, rebound, a definition of rebound, and uh, a finger saying, you're out of fellowship, you need this. <laughs> uh, and uh, to utilize it right now, you know, don't wait. Class time is approaching. If you're out of fellowship, you need to reckon yourself dead and get back filled with the Holy Spirit for the assimilation of doctrine. And all of that was coming up. And, you know, this word would appear, this illustration would appear, and so forth. And it would all be, be put together, you know, and a little man would run across the screen, the screen there and you'd, you'd look for him. And all of a sudden, pow, another word with its definition saying, okay, this is coming. You need to be ready for this. And this is the subject here. And all of that transpired before he ever uh, got up uh, uh, to teach. Um, and like I said, about 10 minutes till, he sat down. Five minutes till, everybody else sat down right on the hour. He stood up. And they all stood up, and that's, that's what they did. He pressed a button, and first part of an illustration came up there. And he, we turned into Scripture, and psh, off, he, off he went to, to explain this. Pressed another button, and with the one illustration, it came right on the screen. Pow! Another, another one came up. And then he addressed this, and, and so forth. Uh, so that by the time we were done with the two hours that morning, he had built a full illustration, but he took it part by part, 
And sometimes he would press another button and a word would, would come up and, and uh, its definition and the like. Uh, and then as well, he has some, he has uh, handout things. Now, one, one thing we have and do that he doesn't do, um, he, he doesn't hand out the colored illustrations. He, he doesn't uh, do that as, as yet. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, but uh, he doesn't hand out the colored illustrations, though he does hand out so, some illustrations in black and white. Whether he doesn't want to, to um, uh, spend the money because, of, because he, he does have a color printer, but he, to spend the money or spend the time, I don't know. But um, I think that this is where we should head for our own edification and, and for the, um, the help of others to understand what we're talking about. Uh, for example, I don't, let's see, do I have it here with me? On, on one of those um, uh, various things that, that you have there, you can, you can see uh, in the Feast of the Lord, there on the, the one side, you can see that in God takes the, and this is the history of God's redemptive program for earth. And so you go all the way down to the Feast of Weeks. Now the Feast of Weeks is, uh, uh, ends with the day of Pentecost, and a church was born there. But now, was it the church which is the body of Christ? And the answer to that is no. Uh, all of this is Israel's program, and so we're able to put that all together. But then for some strange reason, between the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Trumpets, there is a gap. There's a mysterious gap there. There is no religious activity uh, demanded of Israel by God during this time. Well, if we put this against history, what fills that gap between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ? Between the initial start of the new covenant church that was for Israel and its fulfillment and finality in the kingdom. It's the dispensation of grace. And so we're able to insert there an illustration. This is where it all fits. Now, this is just one of thousands and thousands of illustrations that, that we can give to help people have an immediate frame of reference. For example, um, uh, Rosh Hashanah, all right, and the shofar. We showed on Wednesday night how that, that God used what is tantamount to a shofar to create the world. And, uh, and why they call it the beginning of the world. And that a shofar comes from the sacrifice of the ram uh, in the stead of Isaac. And that the left horn of the ram is the first trump. And that uh, the right horn of the ram is the last trump. And that there are things associated with that, primarily the resurrection, uh, the coming of the king, the crowning of the king, and so forth. Then a shofar was given a, 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 a loud, long blast at the giving of the law. And so we learned that that's what this is to do, to remind Israel that they are under an old covenant uh, that was made uh, uh, to them uh, at the, the time that uh, at Mount Sinai they received the law. Now, please remember, what we are doing is looking at Jewish perspective at one time, Jewish perspective now and the dispensation of grace and how some of these things can apply and some of these things not. For example, uh, you can hear the sound of the shofar and under the dispensation of promise, Isaac was uh, to be sacrificed. But instead of Isaac, it was the ram. Now guess what? That particular illustration can serve, easily serve, to, to show that Jesus Christ was that ram. He was caught by his horns in a thicket. The thicket represents the cross and the complexities of man's sin. And that if man was ever going to be redeemed, if Isaac was ever going to have a, a, a substitute, uh, Jesus Christ, like that ram, was caught in the horns of a dilemma. He had to offer himself up in the stead of Isaac, or Isaac had to die. Now, all of that came out as we're illustrating the, the four basic points of Rosh Hashanah. We took something that belongs strictly to the Jews, and yet we can see that there's more to it th than that, and that we can glean by way of principle, type, uh, and so forth, truths even for the dispensation of grace. But um, 
it, it took um, uh, some time to, to illustrate. And so that's, that's basically what went on there, and that's basically what they do uh, in, in an attempt to counteract the influences and the encroachment of religion, especially modern day religion. And you know something? It's a pity. Uh, as I was waiting to a attend their church right down the road, not, not three miles down the road, there was a multi-million dollar complex there. It's, it's, um, it's a charismatic complex. It's, it's a bright red building. I guess they wanted the whole church to be covered in blood. I don't know, but it looks blood red. But it's a monstrosity. It is so massive. And uh, so I was clicking through uh, the uh, channels here uh, just, you know, for something to do. And their program came on TV, okay? And uh, all, they came up there, and it was all this, you know, the car, you know, doing all this, and and everybody's just standing up from time to time, raising their hands, and they're, they're getting going. And they would have their musicians. I found something interesting about the musicians. Many of their musicians had long hair and earrings. And we're not even just talking about one. We're talking chung, 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 chung down there. And these were men as old as I am. You know, I, I think it's demonic, a demonic influence when it's young men. But these are men as old as I am. We're talking about balding men with a, with a line of earrings down there. I would have loved to put one in their nose and yank it, but I don't know again, now that's flesh four coming out. I didn't, didn't do that. And here's what's going on in that church. And three miles away, in an inconspicuous place, the word of God was taught in, in its basic purity and, and in its depth. There wasn't any fanfare, wasn't any hubbub, wasn't any people jumping through hoops or doing, doing cartwheels. Uh, what, what they were doing was there to learn the Bible. Difference between the two. Now that may, might be why Ron as yet had, doesn't print out his things in color. And the reason is um, that he, he may not have the money. They're a smaller congregation, uh, you know, just like, just like ours. Uh, and it takes money to, to, to do these various things, and, and so he must not do them. But here's a church that does that, and all of its silliness, silliness with millions of dollars. And here's a church that, that has all of the other, and, uh, and it, it's what a shame. What a shame that it, that it could not be reversed. But it won't be reversed in, in our lifetime. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be reversed in this dispensation. We're, uh, in my, my opinion, we're the last legs uh, before uh, the rapture, that it is, is close. Okay. Anyway. So, uh, if we do have something like this, it's going to take a commitment of, uh, of the building. Number one, even as it stands uh, now, it's, it's going to be perhaps too bright in here. We may have to figure a way to put blinds on the, at least the, the first windows or the second windows to make it just a little bit darker. Another thing, uh, we, I was uh, going to say we might have to permanently mount, but we could place on two uh, stands another screen over here and uh, make some adjustments uh, adjustments here to and and down front because you have to have a certain amount of space between the projector and the screen uh, we could mount perhaps on stands but it would be something that would be there uh, more or less permanently if we were good to do something the seasonally different we could take it down for a time but it would be right back up now Here's the, here's, uh, the thing that, um, that he did. He went, bought a piece of property, and, um, and he designed what he needed. Of course, um, we don't have that luxury here. We have to live with what we've got. But ev the whole focal point is both to the pulpit and to the screen. The whole focal point. 
So the two walls that, that come out, and, it, and it, uh, it comes to a point here, and then his uh, platform and pulpit are right there. The two walls that come out, because he planned this for, expressly for teaching. He, ha he detests religion. He detests emotionalism. Because he sees that that is what Christianity is all about today. It's full of that and, and nothing more. So his, his, the side walls are without windows. Then he has little slits for windows in, in the back so that there is, is some light. So that when he turns on his projector and, and dims the, the front lights, it's, it's easy to see what, um, what he's doing. He centered it around a teaching ministry. And, um, and there's, a, there's a, you know, a whole lot to be said for what he's done. Now, uh, I'm going to turn this on now <laughs> in, all, in all of its pitifulness. But what we'll do tonight, and I will have a, a handout and, and so forth. I, I want to talk about two things. One is our church, Grace Fellowship Chapel, and something known as a parachurch organization, Dimensions in Doctrine. Uh, sometimes some folks don't understand what, what we're doing since we are a church. Uh, why should we have Dimensions in Doctrine? Okay, and now I'm going to touch on that now, and we'll get into it even more later on. Let's take some well-known men today. If you were to buy a book from, say, Charles Stanley, he is a pastor of a Baptist church in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. But who do you buy the book from? That Baptist church or In Touch Ministries? Which one? In Touch. Well, now, wait a minute. What is In Touch? In Touch is a parachurch printing organization. Chuck Swindoll, when he was pastor of the Evangelical Free Church out in California, uh, he was uh, so popular there for a while. Um, if you wanted to buy one of his books, did you buy it from that particular church, or did you buy it from Insight for Living, his parachurch printing organization? Well, of course, it, it was that. Uh, many of you like the Amazing Grace magazine. Well, what is that? It was that a pastor of a Colorado church decided that he was going to publish little devotional articles from many uh, different pastors. Well, do you get that from his local assembly, or do you get it from the Grace Gospel Publishers, his parachurch printing? Look, look on the cover. It, it's exactly what it is. When Pastor Stam, why is he called pastor? He was a pastor of a local church. And he founded the Berean Searchlight, the Berean Bible Society. When you wanted to get some of his works, where did you have to go? To the church that he served in Preakness, New Jersey? You did not. You wrote to the parachurch organization. Now, the same thing with Lee Hamoki. Lee Hamoki was a, was a pastor in several different places, and he founded Bible doctrines to live by. And uh, as he was a as he was a, a, a pastor, he still got support and means and di distributed broader than his own locale through Bible doctrines to live by. It was a parachurch uh, organization, even though he was a, a pastor. Now, just a couple of things here. With regard to me, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll, and I mentioned a, a, a couple of others here. Some of those groups, like Stam and Homoki, left the local church and just are full-time parachurch. I'm interested in doing one thing only, as long as the congregation wants me, and that is spending my life to serve a congregation that I want to be loyal to, period, and uh, to serve them, but to have it so that we can do it as professionally as possible uh, and uh, distribute this literature beyond our own locale, to use it here, and then to be able to explain the grace message in, in other places. Uh, uh, whenever um, you, uh, you came, for example, um, our brother here who, who has uh, come, what, what did we do? Well, we have given literature. We did the same thing to the Gaskins and the like. 
Well, where did we get that literature? We got it from parachurch organizations that were full-time publishers. Now, now here's the thing. I think that there can be an ideal with what we have here. First of all, and my first and foremost interest, if we never have a printing or a, or a publishing type ministry, a parachurch ministry, if we never have it, my first and foremost um, objective is to grow this church spiritually and as much as we can numerically. That is my first and would be my only objective. Only I have learned, and I think they're right, from these doctrinal people and from our own forefathers. By the way, J.C. O'Hare, do you know what he had? He had a parachurch printing. Many of the books that, uh, that you have uh, uh, today by J.C. O'Hare, one of our forefathers, is because he established, separate from his local church, um, a, this printing organization. We would have more from him. <laughs> but you know why we don't have more from him? Technology. Do you realize the typewriters they had back then? They didn't have desktop publishing. You didn't point and click or punch and kick, as I call it sometimes, because when it doesn't work, then you want to punch and kick. But anyway, uh, the point, they didn't have point and click back in those days. Uh, so we would have had more of his lessons had there been the technology available. Same thing with Pastor Stan. When he started out, he started out, I think, in his garage with volunteer helpers taking each and every letter and typesetting it in you know, a little a, a row here. And then you go through, and then you have to proofread it. <laughs> you find an error. You know what you have to do? Go all the way back, undo this, and retypeset the, those things. But today, through, through the computer, uh, there is a means that we can get lessons printed, we can get illustrations made in color, and for our use here, first and foremost, and then to, to have an outreach to, to others by the means of, of dimensions and doctrine. And one of the reasons that I say this, and some who don't know, with dimensions and doctrine, uh, you can have an appeal for help and support beyond the local congregation. So that there are two ministries in one. There are two ministries blended for our use here, foremost. But for use so that you can take some of these various things and say, okay, and now where does the dispensation of grace start? And we will have charts where you can go from point one and point two. And you can explain things and utilize the, these various means to give people an instant frame of reference and that is the ideal. So what, what I'm suggesting is that with, with what we're attempting to do, first and foremost, we do it with an ideal. If this is possible, if it's not possible, that's fine. We'll just go with what we, we've got and, and how we're doing things, except we're, we're going to upgrade them uh, using just simply the still transparencies that we have. But that we, through these two organizations, uh, attempt to achieve the best of both worlds, an ideal, where our local church, um, and, and by the way, uh, this, this can help the church and a, and a pastor too, by having two separate things in some cases. Um, if somebody decides, uh, somebody in uh, New Jersey, a New Jersey person would probably do this, they, they, read, they read my literature and decide. Well, I don't, I believe this guy's wrong and it's hate mail or something. You know, it can be anything, it's for any reason. Uh, it, would be, it would be directed not toward our church, but it would be directed toward dimensions and the church would be somewhat uh, uh, protected from that. Uh, and secondly, it also would protect a pastor. Now, when I say a pastor, I am not meaning me, but as I've lived my life, I also understand that things can happen. For example, John Records is no longer pastor of the Grace Olney Church. He has taken a, a church up in, up in uh, uh, Michigan, and uh, he's gone. Uh, the, first, the first of April, uh, he'll, he'll be gone. Uh, the church, I understand, is going to stay a Grace Church, but it was a fight. 
Now, John did not, did not have anything to fall back on, like, like many grace, grace pastors. They, he, he, he didn't have it. And so if he, everything he did in the name of the church when he left there stayed with the church. And, I mean, if it was copyrighted in the name of the church, when he left, it stayed with the church so that they can use it, and he can't even use his own material now. If that, but he wasn't one that was much interested in, in this. He's a good man, I'm not uh, saying anything, but he wasn't much interested in doing anything but more or less Sunday sermons type uh, deals and, and, and the like. Uh, so that, it also protects the pastor. And I'm not saying, and I hope that would never happen, but I've been there and done that, and uh, I've eaten bologna and drank Kool-Aid for many a long time simply because some congregation uh, doesn't says, we don't care about you, out you go. Uh, and so, but it can be the best of both worlds, telling you my avowed dedication and determination to build one church and one congregation, but trying to, to blend a situation where our writings, our illustrations, and our outreach can be here and beyond uh, our, our shores. Now, uh, we, we never did get into uh, Exodus. <laughs> and right about now, it's about time for us to make our own Exodus. So uh, tonight we will, we will have the handout. And during the, uh, the, um, the service this evening, I will also have a, a general um, accounting of what it might cost to do this and how, how certain of these things we can attempt to run through dimensions and an attempt to make appeal beyond our own borders to, uh, to establish this and then, then the adjustments that the church is going to have to make and, and make in a commitment in order to make this work. And if, if it's not going to fit, then we'll just go back to doing what, what we've done. I'm not, this is not, well, the pastor's doing this, he's trying to force it. I am not. If it's not going to fit, if it's uncomfortable, we'll back off and just do this and go on with the way we're going. But if it's possible, and I think it is, uh, hopefully we can achieve the best of both worlds. 